After the Sengoku Jidai, the all-out war between the Japanese clans came to an end. It became clear to the winners that Japan would need to find another target for the hundreds of thousands of warriors now roving around the shattered country. Toyotomi Hideyoshi united the country for the first time in over a century. Now that he could harness some of the most veteran armies in Japanese history, he would launch a devastating invasion of Korea. Welcome to the new Kings and Generals series on the Imjin War, which our patrons and YouTube members selected to be covered next. Toyotomi Hideyoshi's dream to unite Japan into one nation was almost a reality. He had claimed Honshu in its entirety after succeeding his betrayed master, Oda Nobunaga, in 1582. Shikoku was subdued in 1585, and Kyushu fell soon after in 1587. However, like Nobunaga before him, Hideyoshi believed that his power ought to extend beyond the confines of his small island nation, and was convinced his destiny was to conquer further afield. The rival daimyo who swore to follow Hideyoshi were allowed to keep their domains and were promised more lands and spoils as the land of the rising sun came ever closer to unification. This was precisely the problem. As with no more battles to fight or gains to be had, they would surely begin to plot and scheme against Hideyoshi. Aware of this fact, he began to make his plans in the late 1580s, hungrily eyeing Korea as the initial target and the Chinese Ming Empire after that. The great unifier's most recent conquest was the island of Tsushima, located at the midpoint of the Tsushima Strait. The lords of this clan, the So, now became Hideyoshi's vassals, and were ordered to deliver a message to the Koreans. It was a threat of invasion that put the So in a difficult spot. So's long relations with the Korean Joseon monarchy made them ideal diplomats, but the outbreak of hostilities would damage the trade which granted the clan much of its wealth. Aiming to soften the diplomatic blow as much as he could, So Yoshishige altered Hideyoshi's message to the Korean court. It now demanded that a simple tribute mission be sent to Japan in order to confirm Korea's respect. In a lethal blunder, the So clan leader sent a rough, hardened subordinate known as Yutani Yasuhiro to deliver the message instead of going himself. Yasuhiro offended his Korean hosts by insulting the size of their spears compared to the Japanese and mocking their lifestyle. Not content with that, the brash envoy warned, your country will not last long. Having already lost the sense of order and discipline, how can you expect to survive? The uncouth nature of the envoy's conduct in addition to the unacceptable terms of Hideyoshi's edited letter, led to the Koreans' refusal. Naturally, Hideyoshi was furious at the failure and ordered that Yasuhiro and his entire family be killed. So Yoshishige was punished less severely, being deposed as daimyo of Tsushima by his adopted son Yoshitoshi, who Hideyoshi considered more trustworthy. Over the next few years, more embassies were sent from Japan to Korea and vice versa. In a crucial visit to Kyoto during 1590, Korean courtiers failed to gather intelligence on just how powerful Hideyoshi's military was, leading their government to underestimate the imminent danger. Furthermore, the issue divided the Korean court factions, named for the location of their respective headquarters in Seoul. Members of the Westerner faction gradually came to realize the very real peril Japan posed, but any attempt to prepare for the invasion was actively opposed by the Easterner group. In Japan, a colossal war machine was gearing up in the summer of 1591, beginning with Hideyoshi's establishment of a massively fortified headquarters complex on the island of Kyushu. From there, he oversaw the levying of a massive army, comprising 335,000 total troops, 158,000 of which would cross to Korea itself. The levies were raised by the individual daimyo, who were obliged to supply a predetermined number of men according to the size and wealth of their fiefdom in a system known as gunyaku. However, it is notable that other political factors could influence a daimyo's required contribution, 
such as their standing with Hideyoshi. The 158,000 strong invasion force consisted of 82,200 men from Kyushu, which was closest to Korea, 57,000 men from Honshu, and 19,600 from Shikoku. How this giant force was equipped must be discussed for a moment, as it's often common to envision Japanese armies as something different to reality. Rather than an army of samurai wielding katanas, the majority of Hideyoshi's invading troops were instead the humble Ashigaru, peasant foot soldiers armed with swords, spears and bows. As the high-tech spearhead, Hideyoshi used a considerable number of lightweight arquebuses, but the exact number of troops who possessed one is not known, perhaps one-third. The plan itself was to be a domino rolling through Asia. When the Koreans were conquered, they were to supply manpower and material for the push into China. When the area around Beijing was conquered, that area would supply manpower for a push further into the Middle Kingdom, and so on. The invading force would be ferried to Korea by 700 assorted ships, which, along with their crews, were requisitioned from the various daimyo of the coastal provinces. These were mostly repurposed merchant or civilian vessels. Though Hideyoshi had a massive army at his disposal, in addition to high-quality military technology on land, naval power would prove a problem for him throughout the coming conflict. The Koreans had just two advantages over the Japanese – their superior shipbuilding and cannon technology. In addition to their relative lack of knowledge of European-style firearms that the enemy possessed, corruption in Korea was rampant, leaving military units neglected, untrained and lazy. The kingdom was not ready for the storm that was coming, but one appointment was made which would prove decisive. A 46-year-old career soldier, Yi Sun Shin, was promoted to command the navy of Jola province. After being assigned to Jola in late 1590, Yi immediately understood that his province could serve as a possible invasion route. Determined to be as prepared as he could, he spent a year diligently studying naval command, whipping his men into shape and repairing infrastructure. After being delayed multiple times, three contingents of the first wave were ready to set sail by May 22nd. On the 23rd, 18,700 troops under the command of Konishi Yukinaga and So Yoshitoshi set out for Busan. The warships earmarked to guard the troop transports had not arrived, and so this fleet was completely vulnerable. Though initially believing the ships on the horizon were part of an abnormally large trade mission, the Korean commanders in the Pusan region immediately came to realize that the invasion had begun. They could have used the superior warships under their command to assault the undefended Japanese fleet, but they failed to do so. By nightfall on May 23rd, around 400 transports crowded the waters off Pusan. The fleet rested that night in the harbor, completely unopposed. After a final demand for an unopposed Japanese crossing to China was rejected, the landings began. At 4 a.m. on May 24, 1592, 5,000 men under Yoshitoshi disembarked onto the land, followed by another 7,000 under Yukinaga. Eventually, the entire first contingent was on land, and a Japanese army had landed on Korean soil without a single shot being fired. After two brief sieges, the main fortress at Busan and its harbour fell, triggering panic among military leaders in surrounding provinces. Instead of acting decisively, impotent Korean naval commanders scuttled their sizable provincial fleets and destroyed their weaponry and provisions, retreating north as quickly as they could. With Busan secured, proud Yukinaga would not wait for reinforcements as instructed. Instead, he immediately pushed north along the middle of the peninsula on May 26th, marching at a blistering pace. This daimyo either wished to monopolize the glory of seizing the capital for himself, or may have been anxious to break out of his beachhead before a counterattack. This invading force first came to the deserted town of Yangsan, then went on to Miryang and Taegu on May 28th, conquering and plundering as they did. 
Realizing he had to mount some opposition, the governor of Gyeongsang province, Kim Su, tried to lead a force south to meet the Japanese. However, he soon withdrew without fighting after learning that Dong Ne had also fallen. News of the Japanese invasion had reached Yi Sun Shin in Jola on May 25th. He remained confident that the Japanese could be defeated on the seas, despite their superiority on land, so Yi was biding his time. Meanwhile, the second Japanese army landed in Pusan on May 28th under the command of Kato Kiyomasa. The troop ships this time disgorged a fearsome contingent of 22,800 soldiers. Realizing that the vanguard under Yukinaga had not waited for him, the irritated Kiyomasa also swiftly pushed forward. He took the eastern route, seizing the cities of Ulsan, Kengju, Yongcheng, Singyong, and Kumo on the path to Seoul. It would not be his rival Yukinaga, but he who reached the capital first. To the south, Hideyoshi's third contingent under Kuruda Nagamesa arrived at Angulpo on the 29th. This force consisted of 11,000 troops, who would take the western route north, after seizing the nearby fort at Kimhei. Three Japanese armies were now set to converge on the Korean capital at Seoul, but they would not get to the city totally unopposed. Revered Joseon General Xin Lip had assembled a sizable resistance army of 8,000 at Chengju, around 100 kilometers south of the capital, and he intended to fight. The ragtag agglomeration of cavalry troops, officers who had retreated from the south and hastily raised levies from the north, possibly could have held the Chaoyong Pass, General Xin's original plan. However, retreating Korean units revealed that it had already been lost, and instead, Xin chose to do battle at Chengju on an open field. At midday on June 6, 1592, as the Japanese were descending from the Choyong Heights, General Xin drew up his army outside Chengju on a stretch of flat ground, hemmed in by a hill called Tagum Dei to their flank and the South Han River behind them. This was a death trap with no possibility of retreat, and this was precisely the point. Placing troops in this kind of situation was a long-established Chinese military tactic which had led to remarkable victories in the past. Perhaps the Koreans could use it to halt the robbers, as they derisively called the Japanese. As Yukinaga's first contingent descended from the heights, Kiyomasa emerged from the eastern route and managed to catch up with his rival Daimyo near Chengju. The latter was angered that Yukinaga had stolen the glories by storming ahead and demanded to now take the lead with his own force. He refused, and Kiyomasa decided that he would take revenge on his rival at Chengju. As Yukinaga began his advance towards the city from the southeast, the second contingent stayed behind, hoping their rivals would be defeated. The attacking troops fanned out as they approached the town finally emerging opposite General Xin's force in a vast arc. At 2pm in the afternoon of June 6th, Yukinaga divided his army into three main units. 10,000 soldiers, under himself and his retainer Matsura Shigenobu, formed the vanguard, while So Yoshitoshi and his 5,000-strong contingent formed the left flank. Finally, 3,700 assorted troops commanded by their minor daimyos Arimaharu, Omura Yoshiaki, and Goto Simiharu were placed on the right. Arkebusiers were placed on the front lines of the Japanese army, while behind them stood Ashigaru footmen armed with melee weapons. When arrayed in battle formation, the Japanese advanced with a roar of musket fire. It was hardly even a contest. General Shin's amateur forces were almost immediately overwhelmed by flying arquebus balls and began to suffer devastating losses. The peasant soldiers began to rout under the pressure, but the brave general would not retreat so easily. He led his crack cavalry in a headlong charge towards the enemy line. It was to no avail. The arquebusiers rained withering musket fire down on his horsemen, breaking the charge before any contact was made. In short order, General Shin's 8,000-strong army had ceased to exist. Many survivors of the initial slaughter 
being hunted down by pursuing Ashigaru soon after. Shin threw himself into a natural spring adorned in full armor, committing suicide by drowning. Japanese armies had advanced hundreds of miles into Korean territory in under a month, allies seemed nowhere in sight, and the only significant defensive army had been crushed. It looked as though the Joseon Kingdom was finished, but the war was just starting, and in the next episode we will see mounting Korean resistance, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.